Well, thank you very much, and it's a real um, pleasure to be uh, here. And uh, uh, prior to 2015, when I was Minister of State, some of you might recall before that I was what's called a parliamentary under Secretary of State in 2013. So I'm now I'm getting on for nearly a decade uh, in, in one form or another uh, in this role, and it's been uh, fantastic to be able to uh, be in place long enough to to see through uh, uh, an important change in our agriculture policy. Uh, I first wrote in about 2011 about how we can have a really radical change to what was then the common agricultural policy. Uh, many of those principles I've, I've followed through um, uh, right into the, the current policies. And I wanted to begin as well by um, thanking the, the Soil Association, uh, and in particular, uh, Helen Browning and the, uh, the policy team for all uh, of the support and engagement that they've given to DEFRA. We've, we've taken quite a, uh, a different approach in the way we've, uh, we've tried to develop policy with um, co-design with the industry, working um, with government, testing ideas, uh, stress testing proposals we've got um, to, to hear all the practical things uh, that, that may go wrong with them. And the hope is uh, that, that out of that will be something that is uh, as close as possible to something that works. But we've also been really clear as we develop this policy program that it's going to be an iterative process. The, the days in the uh, in the EU where we used to have a stab at it, have something that we were lumbered with for seven years and then uh, live with it warts and all and then have another go seven years after uh, uh, reforming it, um, that was never a particularly uh, satisfactory experience. And what we should do is get it as good as we can, but have a, um, a principle of continuous refinement and improvement uh, year on year so that a decade from the point at which the new policies are introduced are stronger than when they were uh, introduced. Now, in, in recent uh, months, look, we've all been, I think, incredibly moved by the harrowing events uh, that obviously we're seeing uh, in Ukraine, uh, but also inspired by uh, the courage of uh, President Zelensky and the, the extraordinary bravery and resilience of the Ukrainian people in the face of such adversity. And Ukrainian farmers have also shown a real determination uh, to carry on uh, and a hope uh, in the future uh, they want to try to get crops in the ground this year. It's an extraordinarily challenging situation for them. Uh, in some parts of the country, uh, there are mines in the land, which means they can't uh, get onto the land uh, at all. Uh, from a more practical point of view, all of the diesel uh, in the country was, for understandable reasons, reserved uh, for the military, for the, uh, the great endeavor that they've got uh, ahead of them. And uh, it's been difficult as well to get some of the key inputs they need. But nevertheless, I have seen, um, uh, you know, there are some estimates that maybe they might get around 30% of the crop uh, in the ground in this current growing season. And if they did do that, that would be an extraordinary achievement in the face of such adversity. Now, obviously, the invasion of Ukraine has caused turbulence in international commodity markets. Agricultural commodity markets have always been very strongly correlated to the price of gas and energy. And our farmers, as a result of that, are facing some significant increases in input costs, particularly when it comes to the costs of manufactured fertilizer. Now, I think that there's a, a great opportunity for our soil to be part of the answer to the pressures that our farmers are currently facing, which has been driven home you know, by these recent events. Because paying attention to soil health can actually help improve the resilience of individual farm enterprises. And it's fair to say uh, that earlier this year at the NFU conference, uh, where I tried to start a debate uh, about fertilizers uh, and the cost of fertilizers and the, the need to look at alternative technologies based on, on more uh, organic uh, uh, approaches and organic compounds, um, well, it, uh, it didn't go down particularly well. And uh, it sparked, though, an important debate and a debate that I think um, the industry needs uh, to have because the sharp rise in manufactured fertilizer prices um, is causing farmers to reappraise their approach in many ways. And the exponential increase in input costs in things like fertilizers, uh, plastics and fuel, is all bound to cause anxiety. But in every case, it is a, uh, a consequence of the world's over-reliance on hydrocarbons. Because, as you all know, the, the Harbour Bosch process by which we manufacture ammonium nitrate requires huge amounts of gas, not just to provide the, the heat, but also to break hydrogen uh, out of the, uh, the gas. Now, as every farmer knows, nitrogen has a crucially important role to play in plant development and therefore 
the success of any crop. And I think that the solution is going to require us to pioneer some new technologies to manufacture more organic-based fertilizer products and also to rediscover some of those uh, older, more established uh, techniques around farm husbandry, such as using nitrogen-fixing legumes and clovers as an alternative to fertilizer. A healthy crop requires healthy soils, and our new sustainable farming incentive is going to support farmers to build that health and fertility of their soil, and also to help them reduce soil erosion, which is also important. So new fertilizer technologies are being developed at pace. A few weeks ago, I visited a company called CCM Technologies in Oxfordshire, and they are pioneering a new technology that takes the digestate residues from AD plants and converts it into a pelleted fertilizer that can be transported in conventional one-ton bags and put through conventional fertilizer distributors, just like uh, any of those white prills uh, that farmers have become accustomed to today. And the manufacturers uh, are able now to adjust the nutrient content, the NPK balance of some of these fertilizer uh, products uh, by uh, using a blending. And the accuracy of them is getting better and better year after year. And there are numerous other uh, manufacturers in this sector creating uh, ever more precise products based on those organic resources and byproducts, byproducts that are currently considered waste. Uh, and I know many of you in this room as members of the Soil Association will understand uh, that one of the things we've got to get better at is recognizing the, the cycle of life. And rather than wringing our hands and fretting about waste and slurries and what are we going to do about it and what are the impacts on water quality, we need to start recognizing that part of the solution is to complete um, life's natural cycle and to use things that are currently re regarded as waste uh, as a fertilizer uh, and a, a byproduct that has value for the farmer but also has benefits for the uh, environment as well. Now there are millions of tons of such wastes from AD plants and also from sewage works and there's also some evidence to suggest that some of these products have the advantage that they release uh, their nitrogen over a slightly longer period of time. Uh, and that can mean that lower volumes are needed overall uh, and that leaching uh, into water courses can be reduced. And furthermore, because part of the approach relies on stabilizing ammonia uh, in the residues, it also reduces some of the problems of air pollution, which is uh, another issue we have with ammonia. So the sustainable farming incentive is going to help farmers move towards sustainable farming practices over time supporting them to build health and fertility of their soil, reduce soil erosion. And I also, it's going to be essential for food production to help improve our food security and those, uh, the, the resilience of those farm businesses. Because if they can reduce their input costs, uh, they can improve their resilience. My great-grandfather used to have a, a saying, his perspective was forged in the difficult interwar years. Uh, and he used to say that if you wanted to make money out of farming, you had to keep the salesman on the other side of the farm gate. Uh, and I think a lot of farmers uh, will be reflecting on that in the current challenges that we face. Now, I recently announced that through the Sustainable Farming Incentive, the government's going to pay farmers to help them with the costs of sowing nitrogen-fixing plants and green manures uh, uh, in their crops, you know, or in advance of their crops, so that they can at least substitute some of their manufactured fertilizer requirements, reducing their costs for the current season. So 55% of uh, farming's carbon emissions currently come from fertilizer use, principally those manufactured fertilizers. So the way that we manage our soil and the way that we can reduce our dependence on manufactured fertilizers also provides us with a great opportunity not only to store carbon in soils, which I know is uh, topical, but also uh, to reduce the use of fertilizers, which contribute so much of that nitrous uh, oxides. Uh, food production and environmental production, uh, protection, in my view, must go hand in hand. And I've always uh, said this. They are two sides uh, of the same coin. And many of the steps that we take to encourage a more sustainable model of agriculture for the environment will also lead to better financial uh, sustainability. It will help improve the resilience and the profitability of farm businesses. Um, we've got to prioritize climate and nature alongside our food security. Uh, and to undo the damage that has been done to soils and wildlife in recent decades. And I think in recent years, we've seen a renewed interest uh, in the knowledge around what makes a healthy, fertile soil. 
uh, in countries right around the world, we're seeing an explosion of interest in practices sometimes termed uh, regenerative um, agriculture. And I think that um, the health of our soils is the one area where I always find that environmental NGOs and farmers can agree on something. Um, they come together. Often there's a conflict or a perceived conflict. Uh, but they, everybody understands the importance uh, of soil health. Farmers recognize the uh, importance of soil health. And that is why uh, we've chosen to, to start there with the sustainable uh, farming incentive. And we all know that the um, that mycorrhizal activity, uh, which comes uh, from the presence of um, uh, humus in soil, a good, good old-fashioned word that I remember from college and is now often termed organic matter and, and so on, but there's something different about uh, humus in that it is living, it's not just a medium. Uh, we're recognizing that soil is not just a growing medium, it is living. And that mycorrhizal activity where the, the presence of the humus, the presence of beneficial bacteria uh, and fungi and the relationship between uh, them and the roots uh, of the plant is absolutely key to the fertility of the soil and the health uh, of any crop. And so we want to ensure that as we move forward, uh, we can support that improved uh, health through the, our agriculture policies like the Sustainable Farming Incentive. Um, we're already seeing, for instance, an increase uh, in um, interest in no-till uh, or strip tilling in some of the vegetable crops uh, and, um, and other low tillage systems. And we want our future policies to um, support this. Um, so we uh, also want to incentivize regenerative farming techniques, whether it's the use of winter cover crops like phacelia uh, or buckwheat or rye uh, to help improve soil microbiology, uh, or to support integrated pest management. Uh, there's a huge opportunity, in uh, my view, to, to really provide the financial incentives to get farmers to embrace uh, IPM in a way they've never done uh, to date, to reduce their reliance on chemical pesticides and use uh, other approaches uh, in conjunction uh, with those. Um, and also um, looking at a, trying to encourage more mixed systems of farming, where we try to get some livestock back on the lowlands and... and um, uh, restore uh, that, that more uh, mixed farming approach uh, that, that in the past was so important to the, the health of our soils. Now our payment rates are going to incentivize farmers to take part uh, and I've always been clear that the quid pro quo for getting rid of those arbitrary uh, area subsidies, the, the subsidy just for owning uh, or op occupying uh, land, is that we must also move away from the income foregone principle in the payment rates uh, for, for what we ask farmers to do by way uh, of the environment. We can't say to farmers, we want you to do this, but by the way, the, the best you're going to get out of us uh, is a bit of compensation for your losses. Uh, we, we need to signpost uh, a profit margin and a benefit for farmers to embrace this. And the, the decision about what we pay farmers shouldn't start with the question, how much extra has this cost them? Let's just uh, pay them what it costs them. Uh, we, we should be asking a different question, which is how much of this do we need to uh, see taken up in order to achieve uh, that all-important 2030 species abundance target? And then what do we need to pay farmers to get them to take it up on the scale required? And that's a question for the, for the government. If we want to hit those targets, uh, we've got to pay uh, rates uh, at, a, at a level that will get the uptake uh, that we need. So the payment rates for our new soil standard already equate uh, to roughly a 30% uplift uh, in comparison uh, with what would have been paid under the old previous uh, EU income foregone methodology. Uh, and I hope that that's going to be a really powerful incentive to get farmers to join the new scheme. But we've also increased the rates in countryside stewardship as well. So for those who think the SFI just doing soils is a bit too limited and it would be a relatively small sum of money in the scheme of things, well, they can uh, embrace it uh, even more energetically through countryside stewardship, and we've increased those rates by an average of 30% uh, too. And of course, we will, year on year, over the next two to three years, be building additional modules under the SFI, uh, on hedgerows, on IPM, uh, on other things as well, so that farmers will be able to, uh, to do more of the things um, that will work on their own particular holding. Now, the final thing that I wanted to say before uh, we go to questions is, I I've made uh, clear previously and happy to, to say uh, again, because I know it matters to many of you uh, in this room, that we are committed to having a holistic uh, organic standard uh, as well uh, as part of that. Um, I, I know that the, the benefits uh, of organic farming 
uh, are clear. I've visited organic farms. It's very clear what they deliver for nature. And I've also been very clear throughout uh, this transition that we do not want to uh, undermine the business models of people who've already been doing the right thing uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. It would be uh, a really sorry outcome if we put in place a whole load of incentives to try to change farmers who've um, not been nature-friendly farming to start doing the right thing, but along the way um, uh, omitted to protect the financial viability of those who've always done the right thing. So as we um, move uh, away from the BPS payment to the future ones, it's important that those that are doing the right thing see uh, their income for their agri-environment work uh, increase. And I think there is something to be said for a, a holistic uh, organic uh, standard um, recognizing uh, all that that uh, entails. So um, the transition from the old CAP system that we had to this uh, new future uh, focused very much uh, on payment for the way farmers manage their environmental assets and create environmental assets on their land isn't something we're going to do overnight. Uh, we've always been clear that this is going to be an evolution, not a revolution. There's a lot of uh, um, financial dependency at the moment on the uh, legacy BPS payments, so we're going to unwind that gradually over the next seven years and year on year continue to build and roll out uh, the future schemes. But I think it's fair to say there's um, an increasing uh, appreciation of the connection between healthy agriculture and profitable agriculture and a healthy uh, environment. Uh, and that's why uh, I'm very grateful for the support that all of you are giving us as we develop this future policy program. So thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary of State. Um, as you'd expect, as much that we were, uh, well have welcomed in, in what you've said, the emphasis on the living soil uh, and its importance for resilience, uh, the need to reduce reliance on nitrogen fertilizer and build natural fertility, the benefits uh, of organic for, for nature, and the case for that holistic organic standard and the sustainable farming incentive, um, but also uh, the, the, that recognition that payment rates uh, for farmers in the new scheme need to be on the level that's needed to achieve the take-up that's needed to achieve that all-important uh, species abundance target in the Environment Act, uh, and it should reward organic farmers as the pioneers, uh, uh, as well as those as part of that mainstream farming transition that we need. So that's all uh, really good to hear. There'll be lots of questions, though, and challenges perhaps coming through. What I'm going to do is just perhaps use Chair's prerogative initially uh, and just ask you... Um, will, given your uh, again, emphasis on the need to reduce our reliance on nitrogen fertiliser, will the UK be supporting uh, the draft targets uh, for COP15, proposing a two-thirds reduction in pesticide use uh, and halving nitrogen losses to the environment? We're looking quite closely at this. And the, you know, the overall principle, it's implicit in our, uh, in our policy programme that, of course, we do. But I've got a general... Um, uh, view on targets, which is, you know, in the past, we've had far too many uh, targets that sometimes conflict with, another, with one another or can lead to a lack of purpose because you've got so many different things that you're chasing that in the end, you're just going around in circles. And actually, there is a lot to be said for having a really powerful apex target. And we've chosen species abundance and halting the decline of that by 2030 as our apex target. And then a lot of the other things that you do along the way to get there are actually policy decisions and policy choices. And the problem with trying to put in place too many other targets is if you're not careful, you start uh, designing policies to, to chase micro-targets and you, you miss your focus uh, on that apex target, which must remain your, your main compass. The other problem we can have sometimes with, with pesticides targets is that historically they've tended to, uh, to quote targets in, in volumes, kilograms of, of use. Now, the difficulty there is uh, it doesn't take account of the toxicity of the products. And one of the things that we, we should be doing, in my view, is focusing on harm, not volume. And I'll give you one example. A consequence of banning neonicotinoid seed treatments is that the volumes of pesticides used has gone up. Because rather than having a small volume as a targeted seed dressing, farmers have had to use far more foliar sprays uh, in order to, to target the aphid pests that they've got. So paradoxically, a decision that's, that's the right decision, because it's a very uh, a toxic uh, neonicotinoid as a seed dressing, and it does affect pollinators on a flowering crop. Uh, but that decision has led to an increase in, in the volume of other foliar sprays. 
Now, scientists would say, on balance, that's probably better for the environment, but it's a moot point. But if you had a target that was actually saying, we just want to reduce kgs of pesticide, uh, the, the quickest way to do that would be have um, a smaller number of more toxic chemicals. And that might not actually be right for species abundance. So we've got to be very careful about setting up these um, micro targets that sound, you know, good and positive um, in, uh, uh, you know, when, when you first hear them, but when you delve into the detail, could be counter, counterproductive overall. And then on, on the fertilizers, I think the, um, again, the key thing is, once you've got that uh, apex target of species abundance, for me, we're never going to hit that unless we get a significant change across the entire farmed landscape. And that starts with soils. And it's no surprise, therefore, that the SFI starts with soils. Because um, soil uh, biodiversity is the quickest thing to bounce back if you manage it properly. Uh, one farmer told me that when he stopped um, uh, doing as much tillage and he went to a strip tillage system, this is on a big vegetable farm, the earthworm population trebled in three years. And you see similar effects on, on, on many of the others. And so if we, we want to get biodiversity coming back and want to hit that 2030 species abundance target, we, we've actually got to get our soil health right. And a lot of that will be about reduced fertilizer use uh, and, uh, and, and more uh, attendance to, to soil organic matter and, and other approaches. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. We hope to see that bold ambition for reducing pesticide use and nitrogen use come through in support of that apex uh, target. But um, you're right that we need to get the specifics of the targets right, not to uh, have unintended consequences. Now I'm going to turn to our panel uh, and give them the opportunity to ask a question to the Secretary of State. So let me start with Professor Tim Benton. Thank you very much. Um, I've got so many questions, it's difficult to uh, hone in on one. Um, I think from, from my perspective as a food systems person, we have a local food production, we have trade, and then we have the aggregate of demand that all together produce the pressure on land. And re re reducing the pressure on land can be brought about by changing how we grow. It can be brought about by changing how much we grow. It can be brought about by changing what, what we grow. So where in this kind of panoply of demand side changes, food production for export, food production for locality, do you think we ought to be, or, you know, putting the question in another way, we could go, as a country, completely organic. We could stop exporting. We could grow a whole range of different things to try to move towards self-sufficiency. Every single one of these options comes, comes with a cost, but I'd like to hear your view about where does particularly the relationship between local production, export and import, and human health and through diet fit in with this, particularly in the light of Henry Dimbleby's let's start getting diets aligned with agriculture, aligned with, with land use. Yes, I mean, um, it's a big complex <laughs> yeah, area. So I think you've asked all your questions bundled in, into one. You know? um, the, the, I think there's two things uh, I would make. First of all, on, on food security, which is very topical at the moment, people are talking about it a lot. Um, it's very important in, in my view. There are two uh, linked but quite distinct concepts. Um, food security uh, is in many ways a global concept and probably the greatest challenge it's going to face over the next two decades, you know, is going to come from climate change because one of the first uh, effects of climate change that we're already seeing in parts of the world is water scarcity. And some of the big uh, agricultural producing areas of the world, including in the United States where I've just been, um, they are uh, starting to uh, be quite concerned about availability of, um, of water uh, and irrigation uh, in particular in some of their important agricultural areas. And that's going to be the same in many parts of the world. So in the context um, of, of climate change, the big threat, the, the first threat we're going to see, I think, to food production globally is, is going to be linked to water scarcity. And that's why there's, um, it's going to be a really important thing that we embrace technologies that can give us more drought-resistant uh, crops uh, and that we, we ensure that we've got sustainable production in temperate parts of the world because there may be other parts of the world that, uh, that, that struggle to produce food, food in future. And then there's a separate issue that people often conflate with it, which, is, which I describe as national resilience. And that is, um, in, a, in a situation where the world might turn in on itself and put in place export bans, for instance, uh, or you have major shocks, you need to ensure that there's a, 
uh, a, a good amount of, of domestic food production. It hasn't got to be 100% self-sufficiency. People can get sometimes a bit too hung up on uh, self-sufficiency because actually our food security comes from a, a combination of profitable domestic production and open markets uh, globally. And if we think about food insecurity, probably keeping those global markets open is going to be a really important uh, part of that. But, but our resilience nationally undoubtedly comes from having a successful, um, successful agricultural sector. Now, then there's a final uh, point, which you, sorry, it was a, you did cover a lot of areas, and that's um, the whole sort of land sparing versus land sharing, uh, as is now being uh, described, uh, debate. And the reality is there is not a direct correlation between agricultural output uh, and the, the land area um, put down to farming. So there's a huge range. Um, it, basically, if you look at the areas where we've seen the biggest growth in agricultural output, it's, it's pork, it's poultry, and it's horticulture, and that accounts for a tiny amount of land area. So something like a third of all our agricultural output comes from about 4% of the land. Uh, Two-thirds of our agricultural output comes from a third of the land. And if you look at the you know, 20% of our, of our land actually produces only a very small amount of our total output. Now, what that tells me is that it's entirely possible to have some land use changes and to have some uh, new woodland creation uh, in, in some landscapes and to have peatland restoration uh, and to have a more extensive approach to agriculture in some other landscapes. So continue farming, uh, but in a way that has fewer inputs and a, and a slightly lower output while also maintaining your, your output um, through a growth in areas, maybe vertical farming uh, in, in some crops, but probably more likely uh, things like a, a new generation of uh, intensive glasshouse production for salad crop production. So there's a, there's a whole uh, panoply here where you can have, I think, uh, more uh, intensive production on some of those um, food systems that have a lower uh, requirement for land have a more sustainable, more extensive approach uh, on, a, on a wider area of the land that's more environmentally sensitive, and still actually have room in that while maintaining your, your food output to, uh, to have some land use change um, in some areas too. Thank you. Uh, let's take a question from Josie. Josie Hi. Fernandez. Hi, yeah. Thanks. And, uh, just remember, as a market gardener, you grew from that on an outside market garden, you can have really high productive <laughs> yields of salad with lots of knowledge intensive use of land, too. Um, so, my question is more about um, land use change and thinking about that. Um, as, as you know, Land Workers Alliance is on the uh, OMS engagement group, and I think there's a lot of fantastic progress you described on all the in the field farming measures being changed. But one thing I've seen a massive gap in is um, addressing the animal feeds issue. So you just mentioned the pig and poultry sectors that can produce quite intensively on small amounts of land, but I just wanted to point out that that land um, that's being used for that production is actually elsewhere, it's in other countries. Um, and I've just come back from Brazil, as you might have heard, um, and really kind of nurturing the heartbreak of seeing the amount of soya that is coming um, from Brazil that largely goes into animal feeds that is actually on land that should be rainforest, while the rainforest land is shrinking um, quite massively and in a very shocking and, and really heartbreaking way um, that I think you know, we're, we're not really comprehending how, how at risk and vulnerable it is. Um, and you know, I I'd like to know what measures um, DEFRA is taking to actually reduce the impact of land use change because 10% of the you know, climate emissions we emit are actually through this trade-off of land use change. And that means, um, are we thinking about using waste for feeding pig and poultry? Um, are we thinking about using traditional breeds of livestock that are more pasture-fed and don't need those inputs of grain, um, et cetera? And how are we training farmers and incentivizing to them to make those changes away from soya-based animal feeds? Yes. Well, look, I, I'm, and it's, um, it's a debate that I often have with, with uh, my own policy officials and, um, uh, and scientific advisors because um, there are two schools of thought. One is to say that to get your uh, methane emissions down, uh, and that's um, our most potent greenhouse gas emission in agriculture, well, you've just got to get livestock numbers down. And when you have livestock, you've got to have them in house systems, highly intensive, kill them as quickly as you can so that they um, reduce the amount of uh, methane emitted per kilo of meat produced. That, to me, is not a very endearing, uh, uh, you know, attractive vision of agriculture. And I've always been instinctively, you know, drawn the other way, which is to say that actually uh, pasture-based livestock systems for ruminants, beef and sheep, has got a crucial uh, role to play. 
in the future, partly because it gives you that, um, uh, that mixed approach to farming, it gives you your livestock on the lowlands, it gives you your organic farmyard manure that's so crucial to get, getting the health of our soils right, um, and partly because we know that a lot of the problems we had started with the plowing up campaigns of, um, of World War II, when we had uh, a genuine food crisis then, uh, and where farmers were told to plow up the grass and, and get potatoes in the ground, whether the soil was right for that uh, or not. And you know, one of the things we should have learned from that is a permanent pasture managed well uh, can uh, actually give you some real benefits for biodiversity, particularly if you get you know, diversity of, of flowering crops, nitrogen fixing flowering crops uh, in, into the mix. So I'm uh, on, on balance somebody who's uh, a big advocate of, of pasture-based um, systems where we, can, uh, where we can use those and recognizing that those are an important part uh, of the approach. And then there's a, there's a big challenge uh, here, of course, because uh, on the health side uh, of this debate, we've been told for a long time that people, you know, we should eat a bit less red meat and eat more white meat. Well, that means eating uh, more uh, pork uh, or poultry. Some people, of course, are eating less meat altogether. I don't understand that. But, um, but of course, if you increase your pork and poultry consumption, um, those are much more uh, dependent on, on manufactured feed inputs. Uh, and that predominantly then uh, requires uh, wheat and maize uh, in order to make, uh, to, to, to make that work, feed wheat and maize or, or barley. So um, that does, uh, can put pressure on other areas. And I think we've just got to make sure that through the work we're doing on sustainable supply chains, that we make sure that where that's uh, grown and imported from other countries, that it, is, uh, that it is, is sustainable. There's then a question about whether you could make better use uh, of waste. Uh, there's been a long uh, running campaign around... Um, uh, using uh, you know pig swill and and, and waste in, in sort of pig food, uh, there's a good case for it. But equally, um, uh, no minister in this position wants to be presiding over a, another foot and mouth uh, disease uh, problem. And and it was um, some of these practices. That there's always a risk, an increased risk uh, of a foot and mouth disease um, outbreak. So while in principle, I think it's good if we can use more of those wastes. Uh, it's very, very important that you both get the treatment of them right and, um, and are selective about what waste you use because we do not want to have another uh, BSE uh, or FMD type crisis. Thank you. David. Well, I, hearing you talk, I just thought I, I'd make a shameless plug for uh, our report in this area, which is forthcoming on the right sizing of, of the feed system. Um, I think you're absolutely right. But I think clear knowledge about the, the opportunity uh, that exists there is required. Um, I'm going to reflect back. I've been very impressed, by the way, really very impressed with, with the coherence of, of the vision for agriculture, per se, and this idea of an apex target that, that can bring it all together. It feels um, very complete and, uh, and good. And yet, I'm also cognizant that the food system requires a change that needs buy-in from outside of the agricultural system. It really has important implications for health. Uh, we know how difficult it's been to reconcile the need for leadership in the UK with the need for um, freedom to trade, for example. And I'm just wondering, you know, what do you see as the key threats to that intergovernmental, uh, um, cross-governmental coherence? Um, and what, if anything, can we do as a community to help you in, in that endeavor? Well, it's a very nice question to, to ask me to sort of, uh, uh, yes, spell out any differences I might have with other government departments. Of course. Um, <laughs> We joined up government's a fine thing, and we um, it's always coherent and joined up. And but then, if we were if it were easy to uh, to achieve it, we wouldn't have to keep talking about it. Uh, look, um, we recognise in government, so there are um, you know there are some challenges as we as we do trade trade deals. And as I said, an important part of food security is having open markets. So we want to do trade deals. One of the reasons I was in the United States uh, in the last uh, few days was to, to meet their own farming industry and to talk to them about some of these challenges, to get a better understanding of their own production systems, and also um, to help them get a better understanding of the UK consumer market and, and the types of things we're looking at. And, and in particular, um, you know, the, 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 I guess the, in, in any trade agreement, agriculture is often a sticking point. And in particular, it tends to come down to some of the, the differences in animal welfare standards in particular. And that's because um, the UK has had farm animal welfare legislation since the time of Queen Victoria, right back 
in fact, uh, I think the 1822 or 1823 um, Cruelty to Cattle uh, Act, many other pieces of legislation after that. Some other countries, in including the United States, have had a slightly different culture. They've had a, uh, you know, a resistance to having uh, regulations on farm animal welfare. But in place of that, they've actually got some quite vibrant um, private accreditation schemes that actually accredit individual farms to a higher standard. And so one of the things that we are uh, exploring is whether we can uh, find a way of recognizing producers that are credit to that higher standard that's therefore much closer and equivalent to ours so that you don't get those corresponding uh, problems of potentially doing the right thing uh, for our own policy domestically only to undermine it uh, through international trade. So it's a difficult balance to get strike. There's always going to be some tensions there. But we are exploring a number of, of policies that can reconcile um, a, a desire to have open markets and, and free trade around the world to help the world food security with, um, with the importance as well of, of, of seeing standards go up rather than seeing standards get dragged down. Thank you. I'm now just going to put to you, um, Secretary of State, a, a few questions from uh, the audience, both here in the room and you may be aware we've got uh, around 700 people who are joining us um, online. I won't put 700 questions to you, uh, but just, just a few. So a question from, um, from Orla Sustain. Uh, the government's food white paper uh, is overdue. Given the cost of living, climate and supply chain crises, uh, can the Secretary of State confirm that the white paper will be wide-ranging, ambitious, and underpinned with a food bill? <laughs> well, it'll be all of the things except probably the last one. I mean, that we've had an agriculture, uh, we've got an agriculture act now that uh, delivers um, uh, what we need in this area. And we've also got um, a lot of other powers under various health acts that give us um, regulatory powers to act quite quickly in many areas. Um, but it, it's been delayed, partly because of the uh, context. There was, um, we've, we've got a... A set of local elections at the moment. So it was either the case that we needed to publish the report um, early in April before uh, we got into the, uh, the election uh, period where we can't publish things as a, as a government. Actually, given the uh, context of Ukraine and so much else going on, um, I felt that it was important that we you know, revised it so that it reflected the, the sort of current challenges now. So it is going to be uh, an expanded um, uh, white paper from the one that we had been working on, covering a much wider range uh, of issues, um, and uh, I'd expect that it would be published probably at some point in uh, in early June. Um, and and yes, um, I hope people will like it. It's got a, uh, it's a it's both a coherent uh, response to the to the very powerful analysis that we had from from Henry Dimbleby, uh, but it also recognises the the huge role that our food industry has to play, both in terms of the the levelling up agenda because it's an in, big employer, significant employer in many parts of the country, uh, but also as well, its vital role towards our national resilience. Thank you. Question from Ben Webster at the Times. Uh, there have been calls to delay ELMS uh, because of the impact of the invasion of Ukraine, um, but this could delay progress in meeting targets to increase biodiversity and reduce farming emissions. Will you press on with the transition as fast as planned? Uh, yes, we are going to press on. Um, and, and there are you know, a number of reasons for that. Um, the first is that when we look at the impacts on different sectors from the, the current uh, crisis, the, um, the areas that are probably going to be hardest hit and may find it hardest to pass on their, their costs will probably be pigs and poultry. Um, and they don't benefit from the BPS payment at all. So if you just uh, retained a slightly larger area-based subsidy you actually wouldn't be giving any help to the sectors that need it most. The sectors that probably uh, won't need it uh, because they're going to see a significant increase in um, the, the, the price of wheat in this current season uh, and probably a significant further increase in their gross margin, having already had a couple of good years, are the, um, the arable uh, sector, uh, particularly those in, in, uh, in milling wheat. And so you, um, they have thousands of acres, you'd be giving them uh, an increased financial payment when they probably don't need it and the sectors that do need it wouldn't get anything. So it's not the right um, solution in any uh, way to the current challenges that we face. And you know, we also think that as we, as we move forward, there are lots of things we, we can do. So we're looking at uh, issues such as risk management and uh, whether there's something we can do uh, in, in that space to help farmers uh, through this. We're also um, uh, refocusing the SFI so that it supports uh, green manures, as I said, and nitrogen-fixing legumes so that we actually 
uh, have redesigned that so that farmers can use the SFI as a tool to reduce their fertilizer costs. So it's got a direct benefit uh, to them uh, to them in that. Um, but you know, the question is, to, to what problem uh, is a subsidy on land ownership the answer? And I've got to be honest, I can't think of one. And so whatever the challenge is, there will always be a better policy response than uh, an arbitrary um, subsidy for land ownership. Or widespread uptake of agroforestry to help meet biodiversity and carbon targets? Uh, yes, we see that this is, is going to have uh, an important role to play. And we'll either be picking this up uh, potentially through a future SFI standard um, or possibly as well through um, the, the landscape recovery uh, standard. But it's clear to us that we've got some very um, high ambitions for tree planting. And because we have to uh, ensure that we've still got agricultural production uh, and we, we can't just have uh, huge areas of land given over to, to woodland creation, getting more trees in that farmed landscape whether it's uh, silver pasture or other similar uh, approaches, um, patches of, of trees within permanent pasture, um, that's going to be a very important part uh, of the approach, uh, in my view. And if we can get more trees, particularly sort of around, um, you know, sort of riparian trees around um, uh, river systems as well, uh, I think that's got a lot of benefits for uh, water quality and can create wildlife corridors with the uh, the river's becoming a, a kind of highway for nature to, to spread. Uh, I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for approaches other than just um, hectareage of, of trees, but actually using uh, trees quite creatively within the farmed landscape. Brilliant. Great to hear that. That, that it's, it will be the focus of the session that follows this one. Uh, does the Secretary of State agree that schools and hospitals should be buying from nature-friendly British farms with good animal welfare, and will he confirm that public procurement standards will be raised and enforced uh, as recommended by Dimbleby's National Food Strategy? Uh, yes, we're looking at this again. Um, and, and for me, I, I always have a sense of deja vu when we talk about uh, public procurement because um, when I first joined the department, we had the government buying standard and uh, we were trying to strengthen and improve that, and we did. Uh, we then asked somebody called Peter Bonfield. Some of you may, may recall this if you've been around for a while to do a big piece of work um, on how we could have more balanced procurement and, and he developed a concept called the balanced scorecard where we would look at not just the price uh, but also um, other factors such as socio-economic benefit, environmental benefits and so on. Uh, that I think was a really powerful piece of work and we then mandated it in um, at Crown Commercial so that government departments had to, to follow it. Um, I think it's fair to say that over time that's not probably been um, followed as, as well as it should be. So we are doing a piece of work at the moment to, to look afresh at the issue of procurement. We've obviously got more freedom outside the European Union to, uh, to, to mandate more directly that, uh, that, that people should be buying um, local or buying British and so on. Uh, and it is an area that we are, we are looking at. It's something that the Prime Minister is very keen that we, uh, that we look at too. Perhaps a final question. So does the Secretary of State uh, really believe that Elms is yet ambitious enough to deliver the sustainable farming system that we need um, in light of other competing drivers? Does it pay enough to incentivize uh, farmers to deliver it? And if so, why do many farmers still lack confidence? I think when you have a, a period of change, uh, you know, there's always going to be some anxiety. And of course, farmers you know, look at the dependence they've had on the BPS over a number of years towards the, the viability of their farm, and I recognize that. But we also, um, you know, we also need to recognize that probably about half of the BPS payment um, disappeared in terms of uh, inflated land rents straight away. So it didn't, doesn't go to the, the farmer, it goes to the, to the landowner in many cases. And it just can't be the right, the, the right policy for the future. So you know, in my view, and I understand the anxiety, it's very important that you, you try in, these, in moments of change like this, you try to keep the focus uh, on, on conceptually having things right. And that means being clear about what you're paying farmers for, being clear that you're going to pay them well so you don't begrudge them a margin for what you're asking them to do. You know, being clear that it's our problem, not theirs, if we're not paying uh, well enough, because they won't uh, uh, engage in the schemes if we're not paying enough, and then we won't hit our targets. So it's a, an obligation on government to hit its targets, and therefore our responsibility to, to pay what's necessary to get the uptake right. Uh, but we've also got to get value for money, so we don't want to pay people uh, money when, when other farmers uh, might, might do this um, uh, you know, for less. So we've got to get that, um, that balance right. 
But, but absolutely, we, the, the, the trick for me is that the quid pro quo for getting rid um, uh, of a ludicrous uh, area-based subsidy, uh, which literally subsidizes uh, some of the wealthiest landowners uh, in the country for nothing more than owning land, um, the quid pro quo for getting rid of that is that we have to have um, a profit margin uh, in the, the schemes that we're inviting farmers to join so that they have an incentive uh, to join them. And if we can get that bit right, uh, and bear in mind uh, that in England we've got um, you know, two billion pounds uh, a year to, to redeploy in such a way, and for the UK as a whole it's around three billion if the other parts of the UK follow, uh, that's a, a powerful incentive if we can repurpose it uh, you know, during this period. Thank you so much, Secretary of State. Uh, we'll call a halt to questions there. You've done a very good shift. Thank you so right. much for uh, giving up your time today to come and, and support this conference uh, and take so many questions. Uh, I think you've set out a very clear and compelling vision for that uh, sustainable farming uh, transition that we need to see. Uh, we heard from T Professor Tim Benton earlier today how crucial that uh, the context of the food system is and the need to shift demand um, also alongside that. So I think we'll all take huge reassurance uh, when we see the government's white paper response to uh, the national food strategy really get behind both that vision for sustainable farming transition and more agroecological farming, but also those policies that can make that shift to healthier and more sustainable diets that a little bit easier uh, for everyone. But thank you very much. Let's all show appreciation. Thank to you.